Since I started this channel, there has been one conversation that's dominated the art world. We turn now to Art Basel, Miami, a place for fine art, quirky installations, and now NFTs, a type of digital art that is all the rage. But when it comes to art, I'm much more of a 1522 guy than a 2022 guy. So I thought to myself, how could I take this topic and make it about the Renaissance? But then I looked into it, and it turns out NFTs are kind of about the Renaissance. NFT stands for non-fungible token, and in extremely broad strokes, it's a piece of code that gets a unique identifier when it's entered into a blockchain. Essentially, it's a non-duplicatable certificate of authenticity for a digital asset. And one of the most common uses for this technology is in the art world, where collectors can buy NFTs as a way of owning digital art because while anybody can copy and save this picture of a cat, there's only one NFT associated with it. There can be only one. Now, before I go any further, I should mention this video is not about crypto or blockchain or any of the problems associated with NFTs like fraud and volatility and their environmental impact. And I'm also not talking about other use cases of NFTs or the broader potential of Web3. Instead, this is a video about the role that NFTs fill in the art world. It's a role that was created during the Renaissance, a time that fundamentally changed how Western society values works of art. But it's a story that starts even earlier. During the Middle Ages, people mainly valued works of art for the materials used to make them. Large tapestries made of fine silk, silver platters, these were far more valuable than paintings. And when it came to painting, it was the materials that took pride of place. So contracts from the late Middle Ages go to great lengths to specify how much gold is to be used in a painting, as well as the quality of the blue pigment, which was made from an expensive imported stone called lapis lazuli. You're my boy, Blue! So works of art were valuable in the Middle Ages, but not because they were unique objects. However, there was a type of object that was valued for its singularity during the Middle Ages, and that was the relic. Now, relics were tangible pieces of sacred history that were often venerated in churches, things like the right pinky toe of St. Anthony of Padua or a spike from the crown of thorns. Now, these were objects you could not substitute for. I mean, St. Anthony of Padua only had one right pinky toe. And so the relic, with its singular connection to a holy person, was prized as a unique object, while a work of art was mainly valued for its materials. But all this began to change in the Renaissance. Now, up until the Renaissance, painters and sculptors were basically considered craftsmen. If what was valuable about your painting was the amount of gold, then it made sense that you were thought of like a goldsmith. I love gold! But that began to change when a painter named Giorgio Vasari wrote what is considered to be the first work of modern art history, the lives of the artists. In The Lives, Vasari charts the development of Italian art from Giotto, the 13th century Florentine painter who took the first steps beyond the rigidity of the Middle Ages, all the way up to Michelangelo, whom Vasari credits with bringing painting and sculpture to a state of perfection. For Vasari, artists weren't craftspeople. They were great geniuses, visionary storytellers advancing human culture. And so when you look at artist contracts from the Renaissance, you start to see a shift. Instead of emphasizing the amount of gold and fancy blue pigment, the focus becomes how much painting is done by the actual master as opposed to his workshop assistants. The inspired genius, Raphael himself, putting brush to canvas, that's what's valuable in a painting. It's because this man is a creative genius. And so paintings came to be valued as singular artifacts. I mean, in essence, they became relics. I mean, sure, you could paint a copy of the Sistine Madonna, but there was only one real one painted by Raphael himself. Now, there's also another piece of this transformation, and that was the idea of painting as a liberal art. So part of the reason painters were considered craftspeople is that painting was a manual task, and at the time, that was seen as undignified. I mean, a duchess or a prince, they could write poetry because that was something you did with your mind, but they could never paint because that would involve getting your hands dirty. Wants to get their hands dirty. 
And so to combat this, Vasari made the case that at its heart, painting was actually an intellectual exercise. The real work of the painter wasn't actually putting pigment on canvas, but coming up with a novel way to arrange figures and tell a story, a term Vasari called invenzione or invention. And it makes sense if you think about it. I mean, Thomas Edison isn't important because he made the first light bulb, but because he came up with the idea for the light bulb. Now this became even more important with the development of printing in the late 15th century. So in printmaking, there's usually an artist who makes a drawing to serve as the basis of the print, and then a specially trained engraver who prepared the plates. Now the engraver is credited with the word fetch it, or made it, while the artist gets the word invented. In Renaissance Italy, being an artist meant being an ideas guy. Now, since the Renaissance, these two ideas, art as physical relic and art as immaterial idea, have had a huge impact on the art world. Treating art as a relic has shaped the marketability of art. It's why Basquiat's and Van Gogh's set auction records, and why Leonardo's Salvatore Mundi sold for so much, even though it's not in great condition. I mean, it doesn't matter what it looks like as long as it was touched by the great Leonardo. These are by Leonardo da Vinci. On the other hand, treating art as an idea has pushed intellectual boundaries. It's why you have modern movements organized around manifestos. And there are things like performance art and land art and conceptual art and digital art. Of course, the problem is you can't really sell an idea. I mean, a Saul LeWitt wall drawing isn't something that Saul LeWitt actually makes himself. It's just a set of instructions on how to draw on a wall. I mean, anyone could follow the instructions and have an authentic Saul LeWitt. And digital artworks are the same way. They're essentially sets of instructions, lines of code that can be infinitely reproduced. And so what NFTs do is they take a work of art that's an ephemeral idea and they turn it into a relic. They create something singular, something that can be bought and sold and venerated as a true original. Now, of course, it remains to be seen whether NFTs will retain their value in the art world. I mean, will Beeple minting an NFT hold the same mystique as Raphael touching his brush to a canvas? Only time will tell. But what's clear is that NFTs represent a 21st century response to 16th century ideas about art. When Vasari wrote The Lives of the Artists, he gave us a notion of the artist as a heroic, divinely inspired genius, a kind of secular saint whose physical traces on Earth have a sort of cultural holiness. And so today, in an era when artists no longer necessarily leave us physical relics, perhaps it's the NFTs that will step in to take their place.